Good evening, my name is Rita Hicks and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Houston Area Education Fund, I'd like to welcome you to Conversations with the Candidates. We have a really exciting group of conversations for you tonight, all having to do with the U.S. Congressional District 7 race. But before we jump into those, I want to take a brief moment to tell you that our voter guide is out. Um, it's hot off the presses. If you want to know the races that are going to be on your ballot this uh, this primary election season, all you have to do is go to vote411.org, search by zip code, and there will you'll find the races and all the candidates that submitted information to us um, about their policy views will be posted in the voter guide. Additionally, I just want to remind everyone that early voting starts next Tuesday, February 20th. You can find information about where you can go to vote and information about the two, two the Two primary, the two primaries that are going to be um, uh, early voting next week at vote411.org also. Remember, during early voting, you can vote in at any precinct, and um, you do not have to be registered as a Republican or a Democrat to vote in the primaries. So I want to hop right in, and um, we have an, extended the invitation to participate in this conversation to every candidate in the race for U.S. Congressional District 7. The candidates that you see tonight are the ones that accepted our invitation. Each of them has received equal time and the same questions in the same order and if you aren't able to catch this entire conversation live tonight not to worry it will be available for you on the Houston Media Source YouTube, YouTube channel as quickly as possible so um, I also want to mention that I'm going to defer as much time as I can to our candidates tonight, which means I'm only going to give you a very brief biography for each of them as they take their seat, um, uh, uh, join me in the hot seat. And uh, if you want to read their full biographies, those two are available for you to review on vote411.org. The first candidate that we have uh, with us tonight is Alex Triantepoulos. He is, I was, I'm just so excited that I said that right, I was practicing. He is the Director of Immigration and Economic Opportunity at Baker Ripley and also the founder of PAIR, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that also works on Im uh, immigrant and refugee issues. Alex, welcome. Thank you very much, Rita, for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, so the uh, first question, actually, is um, one about immigration, mm -hmm. and the question is this. Congress has struggled for some time now with how to tackle comprehensive immigration reform. What does that phrase mean to you and what do you think is the first step? Sure. Well, comprehensive immigration reform to me means looking at the whole set of issues that affect our immigration system, whether that's keeping families together, strengthening our economy, or also playing a role in terms of humanitarian issues uh, in the world as well. And so when it comes to the, the changes that are needed, our, our immigration system currently is broken in many ways. And that starts with the fact that uh, there are dreamers, people who arrived here as uh, young, uh, young immigrants with their family and who have been getting educated here and trying to be a part of our education system and our economy as well and haven't had a chance to get uh, immigration documentation because of our current uh, laws and the, the way that the, the laws are currently written. And so uh, when it comes to what we can do about DREAMers, we should help them get on a path to citizenship. And I think that's actually the first step of what we can do in terms of fixing our immigration system and, try, and starting to create real solutions for people that will benefit everyone. But it also means looking at how we can keep families together and, and what reasonable policies we can come up with to do that. And of course, as I mentioned, making sure that we're building a strong economy and using our immigration system to help us do that. I actually uh, went to Austin to submit written testimony almost a year ago today to speak out against SB4, the Senate bill uh, that's uh, really, frankly, an anti-immigration bill. And I did that because of the fact that that bill uh, hurts immigrant families, but it also hurts our community as a whole because it makes us all less safe. It also addresses, or I should say, uh, creates issues with respect to our economy as well. And again, it ke keeps families from staying together. So there's a lot of work we need to do in our immigration system. Like like I said, it would start with uh, getting dreamers on a path to citizenship, and then there's much more we can do as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question, recently the Department of Education announced that we'll no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students barred from uh, school bathrooms that match their gender, gender identity. And obviously this has been a hot topic of conversation not only at the local level, but at the state level in the last legislative session as well. The question is, what's your position on this issue? 
Well, my position on this issue is that we should be creating an educational system and, a, and an environment for students where everyone can thrive and everyone can feel comfortable and safe and like they're a part of the community that they're, of the school that they're in. And so when it comes to bills that uh, seek to create confusion on this issue, I think it's really uh, an attempt to create a solution that's in search of a problem. I mean, it's about uh, creating uh, an, a, a set of uncertainties for people that really don't exist. And so uh, when it comes to our school system in Texas, we've been doing just fine without these types of laws. And we've seen the business community, we've seen faith leaders, we've seen, of course, school leaders as well come out against these types of bills. And I'm also opposed to them as well. Thank you. So um, we will be remiss on a day like today if we didn't talk about what's at the top of everyone's heart, and that's Florida. What do you believe should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? Well, first of all, I mean, I think it's just devastating the fact that not only that this event happened, but that there's so many events happening on a near daily basis and, and a weekly basis when it comes to mass shootings, and it's, it's not uh, acceptable that you know, we have families and people who are worried about whether they can go to school or whether they can go to a movie theater or to a concert or even to church and not and feel like that they might be under threat of a mass shooting. And so there, obviously Congress has to act. And I think Congress should play an important role in terms of coming up with common sense laws that can make us all safer when it comes to, to gun safety. And so it starts with closing the, the loopholes that exist within the background check system. So you can walk in to a, to a gun show and you can go online and order and purchase a gun uh, without a background check and that's just not acceptable. Secondly, uh, when it comes to banning bump stocks, I think that's common sense gun reform that we need and that we should have already had, frankly, after what the, the tragedy uh, that occurred in, in Las Vegas last year as well. Um, and so those are a couple of starting points, but we also need to look at the fact that domestic violence perpetrators are often the people who commit mass shootings at a disproportionate rate. And we need to look at the fact that if you're a domestic violence perpetrator and the victim happens to be a significant other who isn't your spouse, and if you've been convicted of a misdemeanor case of stalking, you can still get a gun in many states. And so we need to close those loopholes and we need to study the issue of gun violence, not just with respect to mass shootings, which are obviously a huge tragedy that has basically become an epidemic in our country, but also other incidents of gun violence that are also part of this academic, epidemic. Excuse me. And so that includes the, the biggest cause of gun violence and gun deaths, which is actually suicides in our country. And it includes studying all of the different types of gun violence and coming up with the best evidence-based solutions for making all of us safer. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the challenges uh, of, a, of a person who's serving in Congress is balancing the demands of a congressional calendar in D.C. with staying in touch with the needs of uh, and concerns of the people that are in their district right. here in Houston. If elected, how would you balance the demands of the congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with your, with your constituents? Sure. Well, in, in my case, it's really uh, a case of continuing to do what I've been doing throughout my career and continuing to do what I've been doing on this campaign as well. So in my career, having started a nonprofit in Gulfton that has served over 3,000 refugee students over the past 10 years, now working at Baker Ripley where I founded a small business development program that's helped hundreds of entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses and then also leading the immigration team at Baker Ripley as well where we've helped thousands of immigrant Houstonians to get on the path to citizenship and hundreds of young immigrant Houstonians uh, get DACA, get Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival and then renew that status as well. Uh, and what I've done in that work and in, and in other instances of my work in this community uh, is really to start by listening to the people in the community and understand the challenges that they face and the opportunities that they see and then working together to come up with the best solutions to address the challenges and the best plan for uh, pursuing those opportunities as effectively as possible. And so in Congress, it really is about making sure that I'm staying in close touch with community partners that I've already built relationships with over the many years that I've been working in this community. It means spending as much time on the ground as possible. Uh, during the campaign, I've been knocking on doors, on hundreds of doors every week and talking to people in English and in Spanish and occasionally even in Greek. And so I, you know, I really plan to do that in Congress as well, be in the community as much as possible, spend as much as possible as time as possible on the ground here, talking to people about their experiences in this community and helping them as a partner to come up with the best ways that we can create a better opportunity for themselves, for their families, and for the community as a whole. Thank you. The last question is really kind of an open one for you, and you have about three minutes to answer sure. it. 
Um, and it's, can you talk to us about what you think are your unique qualifications to serve um, District 7 in Congress? Sure. Well, uh, I would be remiss before we conclude if I didn't also thank you again, Rita, but also thank the League of Women Voters and the GLBT Caucus for putting on these conversations and for spreading the word about the importance of this upcoming election and making sure that people are as informed as possible. So in my case, as it relates to my background and my experiences and what I bring to the table as the potential next representative for this district, it starts with the fact that I'm the only candidate in this race with both business and community experience. And so that means that people know me as someone who's already been fighting on the front lines for Houston's values throughout my career and how I can take those values to, Houston, to, to Washington on behalf of Houston and how I can fight for Houston's future in Washington. We have seen Washington fail to really create solutions and come up with a better path for cities and communities across the country. And so I wanna be a real part of that. And I, th I think my, my work in this community already of getting results for Houston and even getting federal funding for Houston already on multiple, vacation, uh, multiple occasions really positions me well to be effective as the next member of Congress. But then at the same time, the fact that I've worked with small and large businesses, the fact that I've worked with startups and established companies means that I can actually create an economic vision and work together with the community to execute on that vision so that we can build a stronger economy for everyone, for small business owners, for workers, and for others as well. And so it starts with that, but it's also about the fact that we're building the broadest base in this campaign. We've been knocking on doors across the district and knocking on tens of thousands of doors, in fact, and talking to people in more than 10 languages represented across our team of staff and volunteers and others. And so we're really well positioned to build the relationships and we're already building those relationships on the campaign that we'll be able to act on once in Congress as well. So uh, it's that combination that I think really positions me uniquely to be the next member of Congress for the 7th Congressional District. Thank you. You've just been hearing from Alex Triantafilis, a uh, uh, congressional candidate for District 7. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a second with our next candidate. Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates for U.S. Congressional District 7. Our next candidate is Dr. Jason Weston. Uh, Dr. Weston is a doctor and researcher at MD Anderson, and currently he is leading the team working on um, aggressive immune system cancers. Uh, Dr. Weston, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, the first question we have for you is um, Congress has struggled for some time now to tackle uh, comprehensive immigration reform. The question is, what does that phrase mean to you and what do you think is the first step? Yes, this is a subject that I think has been ignored by politicians for a long time. It's difficult, it's something that's um, politically charged but needs to be looked at because there are unknown numbers of millions of people living in the United States living in the shadows. Obviously the dreamers have been a big focus here recently, but that's not the whole story. So when you talk about comprehensive immigration reform, this is not something that just applies to dreamers. This applies to millions of other people down the road. First up is the dreamers. We know their status is going to expire very soon because Mr. Trump has um, canceled the plan and put it to Congress. And we heard today that a bipartisan deal in the Senate actually failed. Uh, so there's a risk that this may not be solved by the time 
uh, their deadline comes along. Dreamers are people who grew up in the United States, came here as children, who committed no crime and through no fault of their own, they grew up here and thinking they were Americans. They trained here in school, they registered, they went through a screening process, they've done everything right, and kicking them out of the United States would be wrong. That would do untold damage to the idea of America, that people from around the world would want to come here to better themselves and their lives. Comprehensive immigration reform to me is to include a program that guarantees a path to citizenship for the dreamers, but also deals with the people who are living here in the United States right now without legal status. I see there's only three courses of action for these people. Number one is the status quo, which is easy for politicians to basically ignore them and kick the can down the road. That's not a viable solution for the long term. We need bold leaders who will tackle difficult problems. S option number two is to kick them all out, to deport everybody. That is never going to happen. That is not a viable solution, and candidate Trump talked about doing that last year. Obviously, there are some bad people that need to be deported and kicked out of the United States, but we're not going to round up 12 million human beings and deport them from our country. Therefore, option number three of having some provision where these people are able to earn a status over time, to come out of the shadows, to begin to enroll their children in schools, to report crimes to the police if something has happened, and to pay taxes, to open businesses, to take risks, to buy homes. Having some provision where they're able to earn status over time is important. Now this can't be an open policy for good. There has to be a time stamp where if you're here on a certain date, you can have this status earned over time by not breaking any laws and by checking a lot of boxes of good citizenship. But I think that the only logical way to move forward is actually address this problem head on and provide these people a path to come out of the shadows. Thank you. Next question. Recently, the Department of Education announced that it will no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students that are barred from school bathrooms that match their gender identity. Obviously, this has been a hot topic locally and in the previous state legislative session as well. What is your position on this issue? Yes, I think this is a um, civil rights issue of our era. And I think the idea that we discriminate based upon people's uh, gender identity is wrong. I think that people uh, who identify with a certain gender should be treated with their gender identity. I'm a doctor. I deal with patients with different uh, medical conditions at MD Anderson, different types of cancer, but I also deal with facts and with science. And there are plenty of research studies showing that discriminating against people based upon their gender identity causes a whole host of health issues that come down the road. It's not just an assault on who they are and their value to our society, it actually causes them to be sick and to have long-term issues that we need to address, need to uh, deal with. I think the idea of discriminating against somebody based upon their race, their religion, their gender or their gender identity is wrong and I think our society needs to recognize people's equality. Thank you. The next question, um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk today about what's at the top of everyone's heart, and that's Florida. Yes. What do you believe should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? Yes. Yeah, I, um, yesterday after the shooting happened, I, I put something out on social media that it was Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday, but I couldn't talk about those things because of this tragedy that happened in Florida. I have three young kids, and taking our kids to school should never have the fear that they're not going to come home that night, that they're going to be injured or killed by a murderous, deranged individual who's got access to weapons of war. The Second Amendment is part of the Constitution, and I think that it is there uh, and will stay there. But the idea that we cannot address this, that we can't even begin to have a discussion about ways to try and lessen the number of Americans who die every year from guns, to me is flat out wrong. Every year in America, at least 30,000 Americans will die from gun-related deaths. Now, the majority of those are not these horrible stories we see on TV of school shootings. That's only one to two percent. The majority are suicides or homicides. But right now, in the Congress, there is a law that's added to a budget resolution every year called the Dickey Amendment that prohibits the federal government from funding any research to study any ways to lessen those number of deaths. I write and run clinical trials at MD Anderson to try and fight cancer. The type of cancer I fight has around 30,000 people every year that get diagnosed. So to me, the fact that Congress prohibits research on gun-related deaths is the same thing as if they prohibited research on cancer deaths. It makes no sense. There's no reason we shouldn't study this and get facts and science and logic to find smart ways that we can begin to have this crisis, this public health crisis in our country be addressed. 
Thank you. One of the challenges of serving in Congress is balancing the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of the people in your district. If elected, how would you balance the demands of a congressional calendar with the needs of your district? Yes, this is a key question for, for the Texas 7. John Culberson uh, moved to Washington, D.C. a long time ago, and many people I talk to say they haven't seen him, he isn't here, he doesn't represent us. If you're going to be a representative in Congress, that term to me has value. Representative means you have to represent your district. You have to know the issues, you have to have roots in the district. So I mentioned before I have three young kids. My wife is a cancer surgeon at MD Anderson. My family would remain in Houston so that I would have every motivation in the world to get back here as fast as I could after Congress was out of session. I did an internship in the U.S. Senate 20 years ago before I started medical school, Senator Bob Graham's office, a Democrat from Florida. And I admired him for many things, but one of the things I liked that he really uh, did a great job of staying connected is he had what he called work days. And this was when he was back in state. He would go out and he would do a job that was somebody in his constituency's job so he'd know the issues firsthand. He'd ride on a garbage truck. He'd be a kindergarten teacher. He'd work at a grocery store. These were ways that he could learn the challenges that the people he was representing faced and opportunities the government could actually work to try and improve their lives. So not only would I remain firmly rooted here in Texas 7, but I would be hands-on in the district. I also, I'd hold town halls, which is something that Culberson hasn't done for quite a long time, so that I could hear from people who support me as well as people who don't. Thank you. The last question um, is really an open one for you, and you have a little under three minutes to answer it. Um, and, th and that is, what do you believe are the unique qualifications um, that you bring to potentially serving uh, District 7 in Congress? Yes, th this is a great question, and I get this a lot. People often will ask, why would we elect a doctor to be our representative in Congress? Those seem like very different fields. I think there's a lot of similarities between what I do right now, uh, helping fight cancer, and what I'd like to do to help fight for the Texas 7th in Congress. First off, when somebody comes to see me, whether it's on the other side of town here in Houston or the other side of the globe, I have to put aside any partisanship, any biases I have about the person, and analyze the facts. Not all complete, sometimes there's incomplete facts, but analyze everything that's available to me, take complex information and bring it down to the key points, make a plan, communicate that plan clearly, and then act. Doctors don't have the luxury that some other professions do of arguing back and forth all day long. Doctors have to act. If somebody comes to see me and I sit there and bicker back and forth about things, their patient's gonna get sicker. Things are gonna get worse. And I think that's what we're seeing right now in our country is a Congress that's broken, that's not working to actually get things done, that's more interested in playing partisan games than actually moving the ball forward. In my job, I write and run clinical trials. And I do that because I have problem solving skills of looking at where are we now, where do we want to be in the future, and what are the barriers to get there. I always write clinical trials to try and shoot for the moon. But I know that incremental progress is valuable too. And so I would not be a representative in Congress that was so bent on getting to this distant point in the future that I would shoot myself in the foot and not work incrementally to do the hard things, to compromise, to try to get moving forward so that we can do better for not just Texas 7, but for the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you have just been hearing from Jason Weston, candidate for Texas 7th Congressional District. Uh, sit, sit tight and we'll be back in just a second with the next candidate.
Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates for Texas Congressional District 7. Our next candidate up is Lizzie Peniel Fletcher. She is a local attorney specializing in litigation. And as mentioned before, you can read all of the candidates' full bios at vote411.org. Lizzie, welcome. Thank you. Um, our first question is, Congress has struggled for some time now to um, figure out how to tackle comprehensive immigration reform. What does that phrase mean to you, and what do you think is the first step? Well, I agree that Congress has struggled um, to come up with comprehensive immigration reform, and I've been talking to a lot of immigration attorneys and other immigration advocates to try to get an idea of why things are stalled and what we should do to get them going. And a lot of people have suggested that we should look back at the 2013 bill that went through Congress from the Gang of Eight. Um, I think that what comprehensive immigration reform looks like is addressing two things. Number one, we need to come up with a comprehensive system that has a path to citizenship for people who are already living in this country. And then two, we need to come up with a system that will provide an ability for people to get here. Because I think one of the big misconceptions that I've heard about immigration is that a lot of people say, well, you know, there are people who are here um, that are undocumented, they just need to get in the line. And the truth is, for many people, there is no line. There's no way to get here. And so we need to look both at the population that's already here and the population that wants to come here and look at our policies to determine how we can best be accessible to people from around the world. Thank you. Recently, the Department of Education announced that it will no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students who are barred from school bathrooms that match their gender identity. And obviously this has also been a hot topic locally and in the, in the most recent Texas legislative session as well. What is your position on this issue? My position on this issue is that that is absolutely wrong, that the Department of Education should not um, should not cease investigating and enforcing the rights of all students to have access to bathroom facilities that are appropriate for them. I think the bathroom bill in the Texas legislature last year is an example of what is wrong with our government, that we have many real issues, including education funding, that we need to be addressing. And instead, our legislators are focused on this discriminatory bill that does no good for anyone and is harmful to students in our entire community. Thank you. We would be remiss um, if we didn't talk about what's at the top of everyone's heart today, and that's Florida. What do you believe uh, should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? Well, I think that Congress really needs to take the lead in focusing on common sense regulations and common sense approaches to gun safety, because that is an area where the majority of Americans agree both uh, gun owners and non-gun owners agree on certain fundamental things. Like, I was watching the news this morning and 95% of people in the United States agree that we should have background checks. And what we've seen specifically from our district and from John Culberson, our representative, is an effort to thwart bipartisan legislation where a majority of Americans agree. Congress needs to be leading on this and needs to be coming up with common sense solutions that protect everyone. We should not be afraid to go to school, to go to church, to go to the movie theaters and be afraid of being shot. And I think that it is incumbent upon Congress to stop sending thoughts and prayers and to start working on real policy that's going to move things forward. And John Culberson is an example. There was, after Sutherland Springs in the fall, a movement to um, to pass background check reform and to improve that, that system. And Senator Cornyn actually introduced a bill in the Senate. And John Culberson introduced it in the House, but he added a concealed carry reciprocity provision. So he took a bill that had wide bipartisan support and was likely to pass, and he added something that was very controversial and ensured that it would fail. And so we're sitting here today without improving the background check system that everyone's been talking about for months. There are other, there are other issues um, in terms of gun safety that a lot of people are advocating for where the majority of Americans agree, and we need to start having a conversation about that, and Congress needs to pass legislation that's going to keep us safe. Thank you. One of the uh, challenges of serving in Congress is balancing the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of the people in the district. If elected, how would you strike that balance between the demands of a congressional calendar and the needs of your district? 
Well, for me, this is something I thought about a lot before getting into the race, and I think it's absolutely essential to remain connected to the district. I think that's one of the reasons John Culberson has failed us for so long. And I've been his constituent since he was first elected in the 2000 election, and I never see him here. Um, I never see him at events and community activities, and I think that it's important um, to be here. And so, in my view, the majority of uh, members of Congress now tend to commute back and forth from Washington and spend as much time as they can in their home districts on the weekends and during district work weeks. I think that's important. There are some great legislators who have interesting plans to um, do all kinds of community events when they're home. And so I think doing something like that, whether it's a quarterly town hall, whether it is going out every other week when you're in the district and um, connecting with voters in smaller settings. But I think that you have to have good constituent services. It's something that this district used to have um, when I was growing up in the district. And I think that we need to be sure to remain connected here by having a great office here and a great office in DC. But for me, um, my husband and I have lived in the district for many years and we plan to stay in our house and I will just commute. Thank you. So we've actually come to the last question uh, on the list, and you have a, a quite a bit of time left, about four minutes left. Um, so it's a bit of an open forum kind of question, which you can take where you um, like. And that question is, what do you think are the unique qualifications you bring to um, serve District 7 in Congress? Well, for me, I think that I have been, as I said, a resident um, of John Culberson's district since he was elected, and I'm a lifelong Houstonian and resident of this district uh, for most of my life. And um, I have, I didn't just grow up here, but I've chosen to live here as an adult, and I've made my life and community work here and my career here. And so I have been working as a lawyer for a little bit more than a decade. And during that time, Houstonians from all walks of life have trusted me to represent them and to be their voice in the courtroom. And through that experience, I have worked with people from across this district and across the city, whether it's representing people who inspect refineries or pipelines to nurses, doctors, salespeople, um, representing people who spend their days in offices, and I think that that insight and that work with people from across this community is essential to understanding the needs of the community and being able to represent them. You know, one thing that's important is to remember that the job of a Congress member is to represent everyone in their district. And I have been surprised and disappointed on the campaign trail to hear that many members of our community have been unable to reach Congressman Culberson, have been met at the door of his office with police officers. Uh, I talked to a teacher just the other day who's um, who went to protest the tax bill and was met by the police. And I think that being able to and having a history of working with people across the community is really important. So for me, it isn't just my work as a lawyer, although I do think that that's given me a lot of insight, but also my work in the community. I've been on the board of directors of Planned Parenthood. I'm currently on the board of directors of Writers in the Schools that works all over our community. I think that's important. The other thing I think really matters is what that life experience for the last 20 years as a professional has taught me, which is, especially as a lawyer, there are these skills that you get. You have to learn how and when to build consensus and compromise and find solutions that work for everyone, and you have to know how and when to fight. And as a litigator, that's my job. Uh, my job is to stand up and fight for my clients. So I've done it. I've tried cases to juries in state and federal court, and I've advocated for my clients and have succeeded. And at the same time, one of the things I'm really proud of in this race is that if you look at my supporters, several of them are lawyers who've been on the other side of my cases, people who I have beaten in court, who have signed up to support me in this race because they know that I'm the kind of advocate that can fight and win and achieve the result that our district needs or my client needs, and at the same time that I don't destroy the system in the process, that I can build relationships. And I think that that's essential for members of Congress. If we wanna get Congress working again, if we wanna get laws passed that benefit the majority of Americans, things that the majority of Americans agree on, then we need people who can work together and who can build those relationships and who can effectively advocate and be partners with the community. And so 
One of the things I've said is that that is what I do. I've been a partner in this community for almost 20 years now, and that's what we need in Congress. We need someone who's going to work with the city and the county and Metro and Harris County flood control to address the problems that we have. And I think that I'm the best person to do that. Thank you. So you've just been hearing from Lizzie Pinnell Fletcher, candidate for Texas Congressional uh, District Number 7. Uh, stay tuned. Just a second. We'll be back with our next candidate. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates for U.S. Congressional District 7. Our next candidate is Mr. James Cargus, who is a local attorney, former congressional aide, and former, um, uh, formerly worked at the Department of Energy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So the first question, Mr. Cargus, is Congress has struggled for some time to uh, tackle comprehensive immigration reform. The question is, what does that phrase mean to you, and what do you think is the first step? Um, I've been saying for quite a while the first step will be the DREAM Act, and even now it's expanded to DACA. Um, that has been pending in Congress for some 16 years. It actually started out as a Republican proposal. Um, the votes are there today, because there are moderate Republicans who would sign on to this, but the Republican leadership will not bring it up for a vote. Um, and so that would be the starting point. But to answer the question about what does comprehensive immigration reform mean, I mean, there's a lot of details in that complexity, but overall, I think keeping families together should be the overall principle of what our immigration uh, system does. It should allow for refugees to come in here um, like we always have been uh, a welcoming country. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, Recently, the Department of Education announced that it will no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students mm -hmm. who are barred from uh, school bathrooms that match their gender identity. And obviously this has been a hot topic both locally and with the previous state legislative session as well. The question is, what is your position on this issue? I think we need to go back to the Obama administration's regulation um, that they do investigate that. And understand, like the case that came out of Dallas, the school, students, the teachers wanted that person to use the bathroom that they identified with. That's how it started. Um, and then the, and I'll say the Republican uh, politicians in that area, then they got involved overturning the will of the students and the faculty. Um, and it became a great big political issue in Austin for no reason at all. Thank you. Uh, so the next question, um, it's a tough one, but we would be remiss if we didn't talk about what's at the top of everyone's heart today, and that is Florida. Mm -hmm. The question is, what do you believe should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? Um, yeah, that it, it's just so, um, one of the tough things about running for office is people expect you to, to make a statement and to say something every time it happens. And every time it happens, um, you, you just, you can't believe it. Um, and it's been fascinating that there's been 
no period this time when anyone's been saying it's too soon to talk about that. Folks are already jumping into the questions you just asked. And that's a small victory. We now need Congress to act. I mean, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, like no fly, no buy, bump stocks, um, armor-piercing bullets, um, mental health has come up. But at the same time, this Republican Congress prohibits the Social Security Administration from sharing mental health information with ATF. Um, you know, that's a simple thing that can prevent, keep guns out of the hands of mentally ill, and, and they're not doing it. Um, we should then have, after we do the little hanging fruit, we have some hearings and talk about assault weapons, talk about um, what else we can do to curb the violence and uh, just stop this from happening over and over again. We just can't, can't handle it anymore. Thank you. So one of the uh, one of the challenges of serving as a member in Congress is balancing the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of the people in your district. So the question is, if you were elected, how would you balance the demands of a congressional calendar, which require you to be a DC, with the need to stay in touch with needs and concerns of people in the district? Well. Um my first job out of college was working for a Michigan Democrat on Capitol Hill when Jim Wright was Speaker of the House. And so I've seen firsthand how a, how first, how Congress is supposed to operate, but also how a congressional office operates. And we always put constituents first. Um, letters to the, to the office are very powerful. I mean, there's, there's lobbyists knocking on your door every day, but those letters were given a lot of weight. Um, I will continue to use that model. And, you know, so there'll be travel back and forth. You know, Monday through Thursday, I'll probably be in D.C. so I can vote. Um, Thursday through Sunday, you know, back in the district. Uh, my wife uh, has a lab in the Texas Medical Center. She's doing phenomenally well. Uh, and so her, her career, her life is here. Um, and so I will definitely be spending the bulk of my time back in the district, which gives me a great opportunity to stay in touch with, with the needs of constituents and the needs of the people. Um, when I, so when I go back to D.C. for those votes, I can uh, vote uh, in their best interest and what they want. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cargus, we've actually arrived at the last question, and you have about five minutes left of your time. Oh. It's, a, it's an open question, so you can take it wherever you like. <laughs> the question is, what do you think are your unique qualifications to serve District 7 in Congress? Well, we talked a little bit about my experience that I think unique to uh, my resume compared to my uh, primary opponents. Um, I've worked in Washington, D.C. I've worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I know how Congress should be operating. Remember, this is what I worked there is before John Culberson, before the Tea Party came in. And, um, you, you know, you don't always get what you want every time. But you work, you negotiate. Sometimes your friends on one bill, your enemies on another bill. Um, that's where legislation should be passed, and, and that's just not happening today. And I think the voters are fed up with that. So I've worked um, in the Clinton White House at the President's Council for Sustainable Development, pushing solar and wind power. I've you mentioned working in the Department of Energy under Governor Bill Richardson. Um, today, I am the energy lawyer for the city of Houston, and I've held that position for my for three mayors now. Bill White and East Parker and Sylvester Turner. This is the energy capital. And if we want to stay the energy capital, we need to not only think about oil and gas, which you know is pervasive here, but renewable energy. And, and our, the, the current Congress and the current administration has been taking shots at the renewable industry, trying to hold it down uh, whenever they can. But those are jobs. And I want those jobs to come here to Houston. Um, so if the job of a member of Congress is to promote local issues at the federal level, then I'm uniquely qualified, having spent almost a decade with the city and then uh, probably a decade and a half in uh, Washington, D.C. at the federal level um, to do that. Um, at the same time, I also have the campaign experience. As you know, I've run in this race before. 
Um, last time around, 2016, I earned 44%. That's the best any Democrat's done in this district since 1964. Um, and I'll say this too, that the second best vote, um, 2008, was from a more generous district. In 2011, the court changed the line and took out some very Democratic precincts to make it lean a lot more Republican. So getting 44% in a heavily gerrymandered, and I'll say illegally gerrymandered, because several courts have found it that way, district, I'm very proud of that. And that comes from getting out and listening to people and talking to people in, uh, wherever I, I can, um, night after night after night, because um, it is a large district and a lot of people and a lot of interest. Um, which is why I've been talking about the need for flood control for quite a while. It was a big issue in the 2016 campaign because folks in the Meyerland and Braisewood area had already flooded twice. Um, and then Harvey came. And with Harvey, yes, the, the, the long folks around Braise Bayou flooded again, but also when those dams got released, a lot of people who've never flooded before got flooded. Behind the dams in the Cypher area, folks got flooded. Um, so that, you know, that's a critical issue that I've been hearing about for a long, long time, and yet the current Congress, the current incumbent, um, doesn't take action. I think the most basic job of a member of Congress is bring money back. And, and it's not pork. It's our taxpayer dollars. We all pay taxes to Washington, D.C. That money needs to come back. Um, so having run before, uh, having to really understand the district, um, getting out in front of voters and listening to them and knowing what their issues are, make me uniquely qualified for this race. Um, at the same time, I think also listening to people uh, that the Texas Medical Center is a absolute jewel of Houston. Now, the medical center is not in the district, but a lot of people who work there do live in the district. And funding for the Texas Medical Center has been pretty much flat for the last 20 years. Uh, so we are producing PhDs, but there are no jobs for them. Um, there's no labs for them to work at. And we're losing our lead. At this point, I think England and South Korea are publishing more peer review articles, or almost many peer review articles, as the United States of America. Um, so that would be another one of my priorities. Um, but I think experience, experience, experience is what you get with me. Um, I've been running before. You can go to my website, uh, jamescargus.com. You can see my positions. You can see where I'm coming from. You see what I stand for, what I believe in, and you'll see how it reflects the needs of the district. Thank you very much. You've just been hearing from James Cargus, candidate for uh, U.S. Congressional District 7. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back with the next candidate in just a moment. Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates for U.S. Congressional District 7. The next candidate that I'll be interviewing for you is Laura Moser. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Laura is a prolific author. Uh, she's written on a number of different policy issues, and she is also the founder of, um, of an activist organization, and it's called... Daily Action. Daily Action. Um, thank you for joining us. And as I mentioned, all of our candidates' full bios are available at vote411.org. So, Ms. Moser, the first question is, 
Congress has struggled for some time now to uh, over how to tackle with uh, comprehensive immigration reform. The question is, what does that phrase mean to you, and what do you think is the first step? Great question. Um, comprehensive immigration reform means not just a bill, not just a Clean Dream Act, which we need, but something for the parents of dreamers and a path to citizenship for people who have been in this country for a long time. And Congress has struggled, but about five years ago, we came pretty close. We got you know, nearly 80 votes in the Senate to pass something that had some border security measures, but the heart of the Gang of Eight deal was really keeping families together. And that's sort of the opposite of what Donald Trump is proposing with his new kind of harsher restrictions on legal immigration and family unification. And I think there has to be a compassionate way to keep families who are already in this country, who have been in this country for 30 years and have no way to become citizens, a path to legalized status. Thank you. Recently, the uh, Department of Education announced that it will no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students who have been barred from school bathrooms that match their gender identity. And, and as we know, this has been a hot topic both locally and in the last state legislative session as well. So the question is, what is your position on this issue? My position on this issue is that we should extend civil rights protections to transgender students. Anything that is for a woman or, you know, any anti-discriminatory statutes should be done at the federal level to extend to transgender students. Uh, I was an education reporter at Slate Magazine, and that was a hot topic, you know, that's been a hot topic for a long time. I interviewed many students who struggle with this and who don't want to go to school and who have a lot of problems that could be solved by having more compassionate policies. And the stuff that Dan Patrick is doing is not American and it's not right. And as a member of Congress, I would be a loud voice to extend protections to the most vulnerable kids in our schools. Thank you. The next question, it's, it's tough, um, but we would be remiss if we didn't talk about what's at the top of everyone's heart today, and that's Florida. The question is, what do you believe should be the role, uh, should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? That's, um, I think, you know, I'm really, as a mother who is afraid many days to send my children to school, I think that Congress has an obligation to act now and not to be beholden to the gun lobby and to actually think about at what point do our kids matter more than the stock price of Smith & Wesson. And that's why we need a Democratic Congress to take leadership on this right now. I've been involved in gun violence issues for a long time. Um, I wrote a book with Gabby Giffords after that shooting, and you just learn how it is just a lobby. We need, on day one that I join a Democratic Congress, we need universal background checks, which 95% of Americans support, and that includes Republicans and NRA members. We need to close the boyfriend loophole, which allows you know, men who have stalked their girlfriends and wives access to firearms. That should not happen. We need tighter, you know, we need better mental health facilities and tighter reporting guidelines. And we need to ban bump stocks and allow the Center for Disease Control to study gun violence. There's, and I think all of those things are not controversial if we have the will. And that unfortunately requires candidates who are not funded by the NRA. Thank you. One of the challenges of serving in Congress is balancing uh, the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of the people in your district. If elected, how would you balance the demands of a congressional calendar with staying in touch with the people in your district? That is a good question as well, and one as a mother that I think about because most, there are very few um, mothers in Congress, you know, I think less than 2% of people in Congress have school-aged children. So I would really want to, I think the best way for me would to keep my, keep my children in Houston in the schools that I attended and to fly back every, you know, to stay in Washington as little as possible, get your votes, go back home. And I'm really lucky that I have a very supportive husband. I have very supportive parents. I have the village that it turns out you really do need to um, raise any kid and also to stay in touch you know that's always been the way I've been most active in my community since becoming a parent you know you see people at the soccer field at the gym at the school play and to really just be in the community as often as possible great thank you so we've actually come to the last question on my list um, it's a wide open question and you have a little over five minutes to take it wherever you like that question is 
What do you think are your unique qualifications to serve District 7 in Congress? Oh, I like that question. Um, so my one of my first unique um, qualifications is that I am a writer. As you mentioned, I'm a communicator. I think that we've come to a point in our history and where we're so divided and Congress people draw their own maps so that they can keep getting reelected without any kind of um, desire to stay in touch with their constituents. And I'm actually talking to people about the issues that matter to me, about gun violence, about you know a woman's right to choose, about the Me Too movement, about flooding, all of these things that we are on people's minds. And I have found that even though I am a Democrat and a proud Democrat, people on both sides of the aisle just want to be spoken to as adults. And I'm the only one who's really having those conversations. Um, I'm also the only person who's already made change in Washington. Daily Action, which you mentioned at the beginning, was an um, organization I founded in my living room that um, spent very little money promoting it. It brought 300,000 people into the political process. And it was just a very simple idea, which is that people want to be engaged but don't have time. So I set up a system through which you could call Congress every day. And it was so successful that that led me here. But the fact is, I, we, I consider the, my army of phone callers to have played a part in saving what is left of Obamacare. And I'm also, you know, I have a national reach. I'm proud that I've um, activated, you know, I have almost 10,000, um, <laughs> I have almost 10,000 unique donations to my campaign. And I have 700, um, volunteers all over the district and I'm really using these new social media networks to bring new people into the process and Texas it's kind of a cliche to say it but Texas is not a red state it is a non-voting state we have really pathetic voter turnout in the state and I consider it my mission and the mission of everyone in, in this race and the reason it's so exciting to have so many people in this race is that we're all bringing new people in but I think that I'm uniquely qualified because I'm actually talking to people about what matters and bringing new people into the voting booth. And that is what we need to turn this district and this state blue. So um, I would also say that I'm a proud progressive. And I think that I think that saying that it's, you know, that social security is a good thing and that healthcare is a universal right and that it's not okay, you know, I, I'm can't I've thought about Florida all day, as most of us have. It's just not okay to be afraid when you send your kids to school anymore. And all of these things are majority positions. And I think national Democrats are afraid to take those positions and to st stake that ground. And I think that I am the candidate in this race who speaks truth to power and is forthright. And that is how we will win, because I'm different than what has come before. Especially John Culberson. I'm the most different from John Culberson. And that is a good thing. Oh, so should I, so. Um, so uh, thank you. You have come to the end of my questions. If there's anything else that you'd like to say to the voters at home uh, with your remaining time, you're welcome to do so. Okay. Um, early voting starts on Tuesday. I, oh, should I be looking there? Okay. <laughs> Wherever um, you like. Please follow me on Twitter at LC Moser. Uh, join my Facebook page at facebook.com Moser for Congress. Um, if you ask me a question, I will answer. I will always, you know, I am the person who picks up the phone. As a person who organized 300,000 Americans to call Congress, my whole thing is I will listen. I want to hear what you have to say. And I would love to have a conversation and come out to our office because we have a lot of fun things happening in the weeks to come. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you have been hearing from Laura Moser, congressional uh, candidate for uh, U.S. Congressional District 7. Uh, sit tight. In just a moment, we'll be back with the next candidate.
Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates for U.S. Congressional District 7. Uh, the next candidate I'll be talking to is Ivan Sanchez. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Ivan has spent the last several years uh, serving as a liaison for Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. He's also the founder of Houston Millennials. Um, so Ivan, the first question. Congress has struggled for some time now with how to tackle comprehensive immigration reform. The question is, what does that phrase mean to you and what do you think is the first step? Well, uh, thank you for allowing me to be uh, in your show. Um, as an immigrant myself, I am from the country of Colombia. Uh, my mother was a, an attorney, my father a geophysicist, and uh, my father was kidnapped. My mother was, uh, her office was blown up because she was prosecuting bad people. <laughs> uh, and then a letter came saying that next time you put your kids in the school bus, they're not coming back. My mother immediately came to the land of opportunity, but for safety, uh, like a lot of our immigrants. Uh, and I don't know why I am so extremely privileged and honored uh, to have that piece of paper. I am basically, I call myself a dreamer with papers. I was brought at six years old. They told me it was a grand vacation to see Disneyland and Bill Clinton, but it quickly uh, dawned upon me that, why am I hungry? Why am I in this room with like 10 other family members now? Um, but I still had that opportunity. Uh, and because of the healthy set of uh, the immigrant blood that we come here to give to the community, not take away. I mean, this country gave me something as basic as safety, right? So my mother uh, joined uh, school. She always said, hey, education is the great equalizer. She graduated from UT again, School of Law, began two massive companies that, be, that are creating thousands of jobs. Um, and it's what, it was because of that piece of paper she got to contribute fully to the United States. Two months after my high school graduation, she ends up passing away. And it leaves me in a state of um, hyper grief, confused. Uh, I took everything for granted back then. But when life hit me, uh, once again, I said, I have to follow the American dream again. I want to be half of what she was, right? And just because of that piece of paper, the citizenship, well, that's what I'm saying, with a piece of paper, I was able to get two, three full-time jobs uh, so I can pay for, for school. I just threw myself in education. I was selling chocolates at Godiva, pushing shopping carts at Kroger, scanning papers, anything that I had to do. It took me seven years to graduate for a four-year degree. Uh, but the very last uh, year, I said, hey, I'm the political science major here. Uh, I should run for student president myself, uh, which is the first time that came out of that, that passion came out of me, right? Uh, and then leading, never having, uh, never leading in my life, I was like, okay, now what? I'm elected student president. So I did this movement, and I'm saying this because it all ties in, um, where 55% of the student body voted comparing every single university in the nation at 5 to 15%. I mixed music and politics at the same time, and that's when lights, camera, action hit me, right? I was still starstruck by... Uh, the mayor and council members, I was like, wow, look at all the real life politicians. And then I received a letter from President Obama thanking me for the work. As the university was getting national attention, I received a call from a member of Congress, none other than the boss that I worked for, a member of Congress, senior member of Congress for five years. And I decided to take uh, that job out of seven other job offers. I took that job uh, and because of that paper, once again, I was able to overturn more than 100 FEMA denials. I gave better veterans their benefits. I gave elderly, uh, I, I guided them through very complex social security problems. I was able to help other immigrants just because of that. And so right now, there is approximately 12 million undocumented uh, brothers and sisters that came here to fully contribute to the United States. Now to address the second question that you're saying, how do we address this? I believe right now uh, we won't be able to pull it off. With who is in the presidency, with our Congress and Senate being super majority Republican, we're not going to do it. What is going to happen is in 2018, thanks to the partners that are here to flip the district and myself, this is the democratic wave. The people that really feel 
uh, love towards the new blood that is coming to the United States. Uh, you know, today, uh, the immigration plan failed in the Senate, and it was something that both parties worked on, but Trump said, no, I'm not even wanting this. The Senate voted it down. It's not going to happen. But we do need to, first of all, protect our dreamers. There's 800,000, but there's actually 3.2 million people that didn't sign up. 800,000 dreamers. We have to protect these uh, uh, Americans. I am one of them just with that piece of paper. You're talking to one that came here through absolutely no fault of her own. I'm educated. I'm adding to the community, right? Um, and then we have to move to an, a comprehensive immigration reform plan in which this is the most beautiful part because out of all 12 million people, I am willing to work with the other side of the aisle and say, let's do a criminal check. That will leave I guess, a, 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 a roughly eight to nine million people here in the United States given one. Let's, let's make sure they, they pay their taxes. Let's make sure they're contributing to society fully. This is a very beautiful thing. And as this country was founded on immigration, let's pride ourselves in that and take it to the next level. Thank you. The next question. Recently, the Department of Education announced that it will no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students who are barred from school bathrooms that match their gender identity. Now, this has also been a hot topic locally and certainly uh, played a key role in our last uh, state legislative session as well. The question is, what's your position on this issue? For the, first of all, we came to this country because we, we, we saw the land of the, the, the free justice and liberty for all. Um, and it's so extremely sad that we're still living at those times. You know, it's so very interesting that for the Republican Party that says, uh, get government out of my uh, out of my life, they're trying to regulate the most beautiful thing, which was is love, right, uh, with LGBT rights. But now, for that, they won't even investigate uh, something as sensitive as going to the restroom and being harassed in in uh, in our public restrooms or in college restrooms. This is just, um, you know, it reminds me of uh, of a lot of uh, the the division tactics that were uh, going on in Russia and are still going on. From, from maybe all its of its foundation, uh, and I can't believe that it's here in this country. And I know for a fact, one thousand percent of the way, I'm going to stand with LGBT, and we're going to uh, get to the bottom of this. And once we have the House, the Senate, and the presidency in 2012, we'll make sure everyone is fully protected under the law. Thank you. Uh, we would be remiss uh, if we didn't talk about what's on the top of everyone's heart today, and that's Florida. What do you believe should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? Well, immediately we need some type of legislation, um, a stronger legislation. Uh, first of all, um, everybody uh, and my partners to flip the district, my opponents, uh, we need to fully see who is taking money from the NRA. We cannot uh, continue to take contributions because that is affecting our uh, schools. I mean, the most beautiful safe haven is supposed to be a school. And I believe I heard it was 12 or 13 mass shootings in schools already up to this point. So Congress needs to pa pass a plan uh, that is fully having more of a background check mentally uh, and banned assault weapons. You know, one of the key points for the Republican Party say, oh, they're trying to take our guns because they're going to, you know, the government's going to take over. Uh, but if you think about it, I mean, the government has tanks, uh, F-16s, all these different things. They're, we can't. What, what are you going to do with an with a, uh, AR-15? So things as the um, a silencer and all these things, come on, this is, this is not very needed. And we, we need, as this blue wave is coming in, we need to be very strong to protect our kids in the most beautiful place, educational place of the future, which is our schools. Thank you. Uh, the next question, if elected, how would you balance the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of the people in your district? Well, thank you for that question. I actually, I worked for the United States Congress for, uh, for five years, uh, and I saw someone that was basically sacrificing uh, herself for a greater good. I mean, I can't believe that I'm even a candidate as an immigrant. Our vote is going to affect 350 million Americans and around the globe, billions more. Um, so as a balance, 
I don't see much of a problem me having a balance. My family, my girlfriend, everybody is really well prepared. I'm prepared. I've been doing this marathon for five years already. There is no such things as holidays. There is no such thing as weekends. I'm going to fly up there from Monday to Friday, and many congressmen stay up there the weekend. No. My boss didn't. I saw her. She, one time I picked her up from, she was coming in from across the globe, and she says, okay, we have two events. I'm like, you just flew for two, like 16 hours straight, and, and it's so beautiful that we're going to go to Capitol Hill and write legislation. But that's only one role of a, uh, of a member of Congress. The second role of a member of Congress is representing its constituents. We need to make sure that we're in the face. So I'm ready to sacrifice myself. There's no, going to be no balance. This is not a full-time job. This is your life. And I'm ready to take it on. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. You've just been hearing from Ivan Sanchez, a candidate for U.S. Congressional District 7. Sit tight. We'll be, we'll be back with the next candidate in just a moment. Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates for U.S. Congressional District 7. Our final candidate for this evening is Mr. Joshua Butler. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Joshua is a, a nonprofit and uh, a fundraising and development professional for local higher education institutions and nonprofits. Mr. Butler, here's your first question. Congress has struggled for some time to try and tackle a program for comprehensive immigration reform. All right. What does that phrase mean to you, and what do you think is the first step? All right. Well, comprehensive immigration reform, um, we tend to talk about it very linearly now in terms of is either DACA or is border security or is fixing the visa system, but it has to encompass all of these elements. And I think a first step is you have to build a scenario where um, you have a champion in Congress that is willing to fight for uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And what that means is also looking at scenarios like our private prison system. Um, we have so many different elements of uh, immigration discussion that need to be approached um, that don't just resolve one particular thing at a time. Um, when you look at the standpoint of talking immigration, we tend to only focus on our southern border right now. And the southern border is the easy one to talk about because we look at the Latino or Hispanic population coming across and people want to talk about safety and issues with people just freely coming into the United States. But the truth is, is that we have people overstaying their visas as well. In fact, a large part of our undocumented population is from people overstaying their visas because they get to the United States, they find that they like it here and they don't want to leave. And that American dream is something that we should make available to everyone. But at the same point in time, we have to do it in a legal way. So we have to protect our borders. We have to make sure that we're taking a tough stance on criminal activity as well and fixing a broken system where we're not causing families to be broken up and creating unnecessary harms to individuals that love this country 
and want to be here. And as a congressional representative, you are to find solutions to problems. And right now we're gridlocked because there's a political tug of war of power rather than actually finding legitimate viable solutions to ensure we get it right and fix the system. Thank you. The next question is, <clears throat> Recently, the Department of Education announced that it will no longer investigate civil rights complaints uh, from transgender students barred from school bathrooms that match their gender identity. And this has obviously also been a hot topic locally and certainly played a key role in the last state legislative session. The question is, what's your position on this issue? All right. Well, my position is that we need an anti-discrimination bill. Um, the uh, Equal Protections Clause under the 14th Amendment um, clearly gives us the ability to make sure that no human being is discriminated against in this country, regardless of gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, or whatever background you might have. Um, it is a tragedy what is taking place with our citizens throughout communities all over this country. And right here in Texas, we have a, um, a lieutenant governor that decides to make where you go to the bathroom more important than protecting and ensuring the rights of citizens, no matter who you are. Um, as I once heard a while back, who cares where you pee? We need to be able to make sure that people are comfortable and don't end up with issues of psychological turmoil because they're being discriminated against. There's a lot of scenarios in our transgender community where um, they're facing discrimination and, and issues that should never be faced in a community simply because of the fact that we don't understand the challenges that they go through. We need an education curve, a real education curve, on what each member of this community is dealing with, and then finding viable solutions from the federal government to enact an anti-discrimination bill that would require the states to abide by it, and especially if they're going to be taking federal dollars for educational purposes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about what's on the top of everyone's heart today, and that's Florida. Uh -huh. The question is, what do you believe should be Congress's role in addressing gun violence in this country? Mm -hmm. I was actually listening to NPR interview this morning with Senator out of South Dakota uh, by the name of Rick Rounds. And I was quite angry at the standpoint that he danced around every topic about um, gun law legislation. Um, we're a do-nothing Congress now in the United States. We're a first world government that acts like a third world government, where we don't protect our citizens. We don't do the proper things to make sure that our children can go to school and not have to worry about being victims of gun violence. We have issues of suicidation in the United States that's at a much higher rate because people have access to high-powered weapons like handguns where they can make a quick, swift decision to end their life. We don't have things like a cooling off period that's legitimately there. Uh, comprehensive background checks to ensure that, and, and we have background checks, but there's so many loopholes that are in them and gaps that are in them that put our citizens in harm's way. So when you look at scenarios like what happened in Parkland, all the warning signs were there. The school did everything right. Like they knew that this particular student was demonstrating these types of conditions that could potentially lead to a violent outcome. And you hear these congressional members talking about, well, guns don't kill people, people kill people. But I guarantee you if you put a high powered enough um, weapon in somebody's hand that can do insurmountable damage, you can place your citizens in greater harm's way than if we find a legitimate conversation about what comprehensive gun law legislation looks like. Fixing one piece at a time, Congress doesn't work like that. Congress is a very slow moving process. So if we don't find a comprehensive fix to the entire scenario we're facing, then those one or two things being fixed are not going to resolve the issues that we're facing currently in this country, which are the 38,000 deaths by gun violence 
and the number of mass shootings that we're seeing, including 18 uh, gun-related incidents that have happened on uh, school campuses already in the first 40 plus days of this year. Thank you. One of the uh, one of the challenges of serving in Congress is um, the need to balance the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of the people in your district. If elected, how would you maintain that balance between the demands of the congressional calendar and the needs of the people in your district? Right. Well, let me talk a little bit about my current process as a candidate and then transition into continuing that uh, process. Um, to date, I have been to 8,074 homes visiting with constituents throughout this district, putting in the personal time and the personal work to connect with people, find out what's important to them, making sure that I'm available. You know, there's a saying that um, a big part of politics is actually showing up and being available to your constituents. You have to understand what they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis and be willing to go outside of your comfort zone and connect with individuals. You also have to make it meaningful. Uh, one of the things that we just did, we just sent out a massive mailing where I signed 17,000 letters, hand signed, every last one of them, because you want people to know that they matter to you. How do you transition that type of work into the congressional setting? One, I believe, you have to come back and you have to host town halls. That's a big part of it. It's very difficult to be present at every single person's door throughout a district and make everybody feel like they're the most special person in the world as, you're, as you being the congressional rep. But what you can do is give them the opportunity to have access to you. And access is extraordinarily important when you're talking about being a congressional leader, being a representative for an entire district. The other part, you have to create a scenario where communities of, um, of minority background feel like they can be included in this process. So often you go to candidate forums and you go to town halls and they're in areas that are already politically engaged and you tend to see a lot of uh, your Caucasian counterparts or the majority. But we've got to create a scenario, um, be it um, uh, an a, a inbox or a, a, or a staff member that reaches out regionally in the different areas of the district, making sure that we're engaging people. And then me as the candidate being able to go to those homeowner association meetings and going to the neighborhoods from time to time, coming back on the weekends. It's a busy schedule in Congress. There's no doubt about that. But your job is not to become a representative in Washington, your job is to go and be a representative in Washington for your district and then to come home and represent it effectively. Thank you. We've uh, reached the last question uh, that I have on my list for you and you have about three minutes to take it where you would like to. The question is, uh, what do you think are your unique qualifications to serve District 7 in Congress? My unique qualifications, um, it stems on the relatability. Um, I come from a background of uh, hardworking, talented, um, not well-to-do family, but we've done well in achieving success for what we consider being successful. Um, my mom's a single mom, but she's a phenomenal human being. She raised two uh, sons, black sons, in the United States where sometimes it's not kind to people of color. Um, it can be harsh realities for so many people. Uh, whether you're low income or, or the wealthy side of the community, you need somebody that can relate to the things that you're dealing with. And why that's important is when you go to the halls of Congress, when you're standing on the House floor and you're debating a bill, when you're writing a piece of legislation that's going to impact 325 million plus people, you need to definitively know how that legislation is going to impact and affect the lives of the people in your community. It's why I focus on the block walking so heavily. I can't get to everybody, but what I can do is go into those neighborhoods and see exactly where my constituents are. 
So the unique quality that I bring is the is the ability to connect on an everyday basis with people. I can sit here and reel off credential after credential, and and that sounds great. A lot of that's political optics, and I know we have to do that because people want to know your qualifications. But the truth is, is when policy drops off, humanity has to kick in. And I think we're missing so much humanity in the nature of our politics these days. We don't have representatives that care about their constituents as they say they do. We don't have candidates that are willing to come outside of their comfort zone and walk in neighborhoods and talk with people that don't look like them or, or have the same wealth as them or even come from the same backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I have family members that aren't wealthy but they're hardworking everyday people that some are truck drivers, some have worked in post offices. I mean, these are stories that you take with you to understand that when you're dealing with an education bill, like if you have a family member that's a teacher, you know the challenges they're dealing with. And those are things that we need, real world stories, real world scenarios coming from a congressional member, not just being on the facts, not just being on the, the details all the time, but understanding that there's humanity that comes with the way you do your job. And if that's not the strategy at the end of the day that inspires people to get to the ballot box, then I'm willing to state the fact that I've done the right thing by being authentic and genuine throughout this candidacy and making absolutely certain that the person I am today and what people see in terms of the hard work and the availability and the access and even the strategy that I've put in place, the policy that I've worked on, will allow people to know that I will be that same exact type of representative when I get in Congress in 2019. Thank you very much for joining us. You've just been hearing from Joshua Butler, congressional candidate for U.S. Congressional District uh, 7. And if you missed any of tonight's interviews, not to worry, the uh, entire group of interviews will be available to you on the Houston Media Source YouTube channel here shortly. Um, I want to take the opportunity to remind everyone once again of two things. One of them is that our voter guide is live. You can access it at vote411.org and search by zip code to see the races that are going to be on your ballot. The other other very important thing to remember is that early voting starts next Tuesday, February 20th. You can vote at any precinct location during early voting, and you do not have to be registered as a Republican or a Democrat to vote in either one of those primaries. You do have to choose one, though. So um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Houston Area Education Fund, I'm Rita Hicks, and I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us tonight, and have a good night.